Pluto. It was an ugly scene. <laughs> January 22nd, 2001. That was the night. <laughs> Actually, that was the morning. I woke up, came to my office. There were some uncountable number of voicemail messages on my telephone that morning. That morning. The phone was ringing. Why? The New York Times had a page one story proclaiming. Pluto not a planet, only in New York. Where'd that come from? This is January 22nd, 2001. What happened just two days before then? Tell me. Inauguration of George W., okay? You'd think the whole page one would be filled with Stories on the transition to power. Why not? They were still counting dimpled chads in Florida. You'd think that should be enough content to fill the page. I have a mock-up of that page right here. Okay. So here it is, and rightfully so, right at the top, I'll read it to you. On the first day, Bush settles into a refitted Oval Office. So there he goes. It's right there. This is actually the second... Newsday of the inauguration. But there's other uh, items here. Let's see, 37 new cardinals selected by the Pope. Okay, it's, it's big news. A local cardinal, was, uh, local guy was, was, was elevated. Here's one. Iraq rebuilt weapons factories. U.S. officials say it's fun to see news stories after you know better. You know, it's just kind of, <laughs> it's just kind of, there it is. You know, you got it. Uh... What else we got here? California. They had these rolling brownouts at the time, uh, worried about their power supply. New plants in California racing for time. They had to get them ready for, for, for the summer. Okay, fine. I don't have, then there it goes. Pluto not a planet, only in New York. As she walked past the, de the display of, of photos of planets at the Rose Center for Earth and Space, Pamela Curtis of Atlanta scrunched her brow. Perplexed, there didn't seem to be enough planets. She started counting on her fingers, trying to remember the mnemonic her son had learned in school years ago. My very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. Then she went along the list. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Quote, I had to go through the whole thing to figure out what was missing, she said. Pluto. Pluto wasn't there. Now I know my mother just served us nine, <laughs> nine nothings. The next line, quietly and apparently uniquely among major scientific institutions, the American Museum of Natural History cast Pluto out of the pantheon of planets when it opened the Rose Center for Earth and Space. So, Where'd all that come from? First of all, we got accused of just trying to drum up attendance, just making controversy just for the hell of it, all right? Oh, yeah, let's just make up a cosmic controversy, whether or not it's true, just to get people in the front door. Fact is, that exhibit had been that way for a year. We didn't open in 2001. We opened in 2000, February, OK? It had been that way for a year. So the New York Times came late in this one. <laughs> so let's back up. Let's just back up. It's the 1990s. The museum had just finished its new dinosaur halls, the entire fourth floor of this museum, filled with dinosaurs. Attendance was on the rise. Yet attendance at the Hayden Planetarium was dropping simultaneously with the rise in attendance at the dinosaur halls. Meanwhile, we had rovers on Mars, and, and the space shuttle, and Hubble was up. There was no reason for attendance to visit the universe to drop. The institution was deeply concerned, said, we got to do something about it. All right. That's when I came in, mid-1990s. We built the staff. 
We looked at the problem, looked at the state of our understanding of the universe, and started designing exhibits. Exhibit designer Ralph Applebaum and Associates, uh, perhaps best known for the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Worked closely with him and architects Jim Polshek and partners. So, there we are, laying out the lesson plan. And we notice, we notice something. What did we notice? There are objects being discovered in the outer solar system, beyond Neptune, adding to our inventory of what's out there. What do these objects look like? They're kind of small. Pluto's kind of small. What else about them? They're kind of icy. Pluto's kind of icy. What kind of orbits do they have? Well, their orbits are a little weird, like Pluto's orbit. You may know Pluto's orbit is, is strongly elliptical, by far the most elliptically orbiting planet there is. Called it a planet there for the moment. And so it crosses the orbit of Neptune. No other planet does that to any other planet. So that's odd. Not only that, if you look at the plane in which planets orbit, Pluto is tipped out of that plane by 17 degrees. Everybody else, Mercury is tipped a little too, but not as much as Pluto. Everybody else is kind of right there, a couple of degrees up or down within the plane, what we call the plane of the solar system. So, as these objects start getting discovered, we say to ourselves, well, what are they? What do they represent? What do they mean? This is in the mid-1990s. We know we want to rebuild the facility, so we want to make, we're looking at trend lines in what science is doing. And in those trend lines, we say, something's going on out there. Let's take a closer look. We take a closer look, and we find out that what is being discovered is a zone in the solar system predicted to be there at mid-century. A solar system theorist named Gerard Kuiper hypothesized that beyond the orbit of the farthest most large planet, if there's not another large planet out there, then there'd be the leftovers from the formation of the solar system that never got gravitationally vacuumed up to become part of that large planet. If there's no large planet, it would just still be there. So he said, maybe there's a reservoir of icy bodies out there. We went 50, 40, 45 years before such an object was discovered. We needed the biggest telescopes in the world, biggest optical telescopes. Right now, they're in Hawaii. The Keck telescope was brought to bear on this problem. We discovered, we, we got people who do that. I wasn't, we got peeps. <laughs> Colleagues discovered the Kuiper belt, discovered it. So we said to ourselves, maybe Pluto is not the ninth out of nine planets. Maybe Pluto is a member of a new class of object predicted to be there at mid-century. So let us create a display that captures this fact. Most museums, all museums that present the planets do it in a way that you first learned it in elementary school. There's a panel, there's a wall, and there are panels. So the first one is Mercury, and it gives you the data on Mercury, how big it is, what it's made of, what's the orbital period. Then you go to Venus, and then Earth, and then you just, there it is. Mercury through Pluto. It is an enumeration of objects sitting there for you to memorize. And we saw an educational and scientific opportunity to rethink how we're going to deliver the solar system to you. And we said to ourselves, that's not how we're going to do it. There's too much else to learn, to understand, to, to relate to about the solar system, rather than thinking of it as an enumeration of objects. So instead, what we did was create a new sort of family photo of the solar system, organizing objects by similar properties. We took Pluto and said, Pluto, you look more, much more like these other objects than you or these other objects look like anybody else in the solar system. You're going to be a new group for us. There's the Kuiper belt of icy bodies. There it is, with Pluto a prominent member among them. Next, we had the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune.